Conducting medical research can be challenging. Just ask world-renowned bioengineering professor Sangeeta Bhatia. During her grad school years at MIT, Sangeeta tried and failed to create an artificial liver. But she didn't give up. She tirelessly kept at it, and her resilience finally paid off. Sangeeta pioneered a way to create micro livers that are sustainable outside the human body. Her groundbreaking research has revolutionized the world of artificial organs used for transplants. I sat down with Bhatia at the 2015 annual meeting of the Clinton Global Initiative to talk to her about her motivation, innovation, and how her research is making the world a healthier place. Thank you. People like you inspire me a great deal because I feel like I cannot understand the work that you do, and it requires a very large brain. <laughs> so do me the favor. Um, tell me first how you got into the work that you do, because it's not an everyday sort of field. It's true. Right? Yeah. I, um, so I started out as an engineering student. I was interested in biology, and I was good at science and math. My dad said, you should consider biomedical engineering. So off I went to study that. And I got very interested in materials that could be used for nerve regeneration. So it was this idea that like plastics and polymers, remember like The Graduate, the movie, like the plastics yep. are the future? That's right. Um, it was that time, so it was sort of like late 1980s. And they were making new kinds of plastics that we thought could help with nerve regeneration. And that was my undergraduate project and I got very interested in this idea that you could use engineering tools and material science for medical applications. Amazing. So, but th did it all make sense to you right off the bat? I mean, you knew, oh, you know what, this, I'm pretty good at this and I think this is the field that I need to be in. So I, I really liked the idea that instruments could change human health. Like that from the beginning had captured my imagination, but it turns out that that's really broad fields, like you could make a new MRI machine, right? That's one kind of research, it's more physics. You could make like an artificial hip, that's a different kind of research, that's actually materials. Mm. And then what we work on, which I mentioned, is actually like living systems, um, like organ regeneration and nerve regeneration. And so it, it took me a while to kind of figure out where in the scheme of instruments meet medicine I wanted to, to be. Okay, but now that you've obviously focused on that particular area, um, was it something that was so new and different that really no one, went out, no one else was really working on it? And so you had to sort of carve a path for yourself? I think so. I mean, in some ways. Yeah. So um, the, the sort of tiny little subfield that I'm in is one where we use computer chip technology for medical applications. Um, and that was actually really pretty new. So I started graduate school in the early 90s. And we, I went over to the computer manufacturing facility on MIT campus, which I didn't know existed, except for that my boyfriend at the time was an electrical engineer. <laughs> okay. He would later become my husband. And he said, I know you're trying to do all these things with cells and patterns, and there's actually a whole computer fab on campus that the, the electrical engineers use. Okay. So um, I found my way over there and figured out how to use those instruments to make artificial livers. Um, and that became kind of my, I guess, my life's work so far. Well, again, in layman's terms, yeah. um, for those of us who don't get it, <laughs> um, how do you create an artificial liver using a computer chip and living tissue? How does it work? <laughs> yeah. So, um, the, so to make an artificial liver, you need liver cells. And the liver does like 500 different functions. Um, so it does a lot of different things. You can't really replace it with a simple filter. Right. Like a kidney we can replace with a filter and the heart we can replace with a pump. So mechanical things. Mm. So for the liver you really need a living cell. Okay. And the problem in the field had been that liver cells, when you take them out of their body and you try and put them in a machine to use them, they, they quickly die. Mm. And so my job as a graduate student was to figure out how to basically copy the environment that they saw in the body in the Petri dish. And that way they would still behave like liver cells and then we could use them to process someone's blood. Okay. And so the way we copied the way they are in the body is using computer chip technology. So we would pattern them on surfaces. We would write lines of cells and surround them with the neighbors that they saw in the body. There's five cell types in the liver. So, and then we would recreate these little structures, and because they had all the right signals from their neighbors, they would behave properly. And how, <laughs> I don't even know what to ask at this point. How long does that take to figure that out? 
Yeah, well, so it took a long time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so a PhD is about five years. Yeah. Um, and the sort of the key, every PhD project has a sort of a key turning point, kind of a pivot. Mm -hmm. um, and mine came after a year of failed experiments. And the experiment went like this. Um, you start with a piece of glass, which is clear. You shine light on it, which is not visible. You dip it in a bunch of chemicals, which are clear. And at the end, your, the goal is to make liver cells line up in stripes. And um, I tried this over and over and over again, all different versions of it for about a year until wow. at the end of that year of research and little improvements and thinking about it different ways, it finally worked. Um, so that, that one year was like the real breakthrough. It still took us about 10 years to sort of like make a product out of it that we could share with the world. Um, and but that, that was the kind of aha moment. And that product now is out there. Yes, yeah, so the product now are little tiny human livers. Um, we make them and we sell them for drug testing, actually. Um, so that if you have a new drug and you want to know whether it will be safe in the body, you can pour it on our little liver and test it um, without having to expose patients to it. And it functions like it a functions real like human a, liver. Right, for about six weeks, which That's is long enough to test it. So the future of this then would be to actually create full-size human livers for transplant. That's right. Yeah, so once we figured out how to make little livers, then we decided we wanted to scale up and make a replacement for transplant. Um, and that we do with another engineering technology, which is 3D printing. So we can print layers by layer by layer of livers instead of just like a tiny little layer mm. um, and build up a bigger organ that way. Um, and the liver is cool because it can regenerate on its own. So you don't actually have to build the whole liver, which is 100 billion liver cells. Wow. Um, you can build, we think, a little piece of it and then kind of encourage it to grow on its own. Um, tell me about nanotechnology. Uh, sure. Is that related to this kind of work or is that something different and separate? So it's an evolution of the same sets of technologies. So the computer manufacturing methods that I mentioned to you they're really good for manipulating things as small as single cells. So a single cell is about 10 microns, which is a tenth of a human hair. Wow. So pretty narrow. Um, and as I got into the field kind of in the 90s and the early 2000s, because we were trying to make computers faster and faster and faster, the field was making the technology better and better and better at making tinier things all the way down to the nanoscale. Um, and it turns out in biology that's super useful. So if you make something that is as small as 100 nanometers, now you can make a detector that you can inject in the bloodstream and it can go and it can find cancer on its own wow. um, and it can send out a signal. Um, and it's, it's only because it's so small that it can kind of find its way through the human body. So it, it, you're able to explore parts of the body and cells that you, that you, you would never have go near to. before. Exactly. Right, right. So that has got to be a revolutionizing technology for, obviously, for ailments and curing ailments and cancer research. Yeah, so we call this field nanomedicine. Um, and it's sort of everything that's 100 nanometers and smaller, so a thousand times smaller than a human hair right. on down. And um, the trick is, in fact, that you can get inside of all of the human organs. So it turns out that this is the exact length scale that molecules communicate in your body. Wow. And it's good both for detection, so for early detection of diseases that would be more curable, so cancer, for example, as well as treatments. So we, what we do is we try and target drugs, let's say chemotherapy, just to the tumor to spare the normal tissues. So it's useful both for kind of getting a window into the disease as well as treating it better. So it must be amazing to you because you're seeing how much technology is helping in the field of medicine. I mean, it, is, it truly is changing the way that medicine is being done and executed. Yeah. So it's, it's an amazing time to be a researcher because um, we think of the sort of convergence of these two fields. So on the one hand, we've had all these engineering advances, right? 50 years of what we call Moore's Law, which is the exponential growth and computation power that comes from growing things tinier, tinier, tinier. So that's one thing. And on the other hand, we have the human genome and genomics, right? And now they're coming together at this moment in time, which is incredibly exciting. Are we just going to jump by leaps and bounds um, in, in the medical field because of this growth in technology? 
I think so. I mean, so some people call this kind of the third revolution of science. And I think we'll look back in 20 years at this kind of five-year period and, um, and really identify it as an inflection point. There are some technologies that have come out just in the past couple of years where we can what we call edit the human genome. There's a new enzyme that can go in and actually change your genome and repair it. Um, and, and, you know, the therapeutic possibilities are just amazing. That means, like, all the genetic diseases are potentially curable. Um, and, you know, I think it'll take us about 10 or 20 years to get those safely into patients. But looking back, I think in a couple of decades, we'll say this is, like, when it all happened. Here's an ethical question for you. Um, some people might say, and they have said, um, that science sometimes pushes the boundaries a little bit too much, um, changing DNA structures, genomes, you know, all of these things that we couldn't do a couple decades ago. And now we're really starting to push those limits. Is there ever an ethical conflict that you see or have gone through yourself in, in research? Um, I would say most of the work that I do is well within what myself and others consider um, important and impactful. And we do do animal research. I have two young daughters and my little one wants to be a vet. And she says to me all the time, why do you have to do experiments on mice? Yeah. You know, and I explain that we do it ethically and how do we do it. And it's better to know that a medicine's safe before it gets into a person. Um, so I would say that's kind of the closest, closest piece that I have. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But there are things that we work on that are highly contentious. Um, I think I'm, I feel pretty confident about the ability of the scientific community to kind of self-regulate. We did mm -hmm. that with recombinant DNA. We had a conference called the Asilomar Conference where the thought leaders came together and set out what the constraints should be and okay. what the practices should be. So and it's that, discussed. Yeah, and that's yeah. happening again now with CRISPR, which is this new genome editing technology that I mentioned to you. So, you know, the typical pattern is that we'll have a self-imposed moratorium for a year or two mm. while we figure out what we should be doing, um, and then we'll sort of carefully engage. I think that um, I think that's sort of part and parcel of the way that we do science. Yeah, yeah. Let me switch gears for a second. Sure. Um, you being a woman in science, um, you know, there's always discussion that there aren't enough girls going into science and math and technology. Uh, and so how can we inspire these girls to do that? Uh, what, what do you think? I mean, because you're success, such a success in your field, you've been through it. You know what the yeah. barriers are. And you know that still the educational system seems like it doesn't try to push those fields for girls. What's, what's the problem still, do you yeah. think? So that's a great question. I think there are two main challenges. Um, the first one is internal. Mm. So if you look at women in engineering, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, you see that at age 11, very early on, girls start saying that they're less interested in science and math and the sort of feeder disciplines for engineering. Um, and we know that part of that is a lack of role models. Yeah. Um, and part of it is that they're opting out. They're, it's not that they're not capable, it's that they're choosing something else. Um, and they're reacting in many cases to what people call a chilly climate or a geeky guy culture. <laughs> and um, there have been some really promising advances recently. So there was a um, five-year concerted effort made at Harvey Mudd, mm. Harvey Mudd College, where they did three things in the curriculum. They gave them role models. They made the engineering curriculum more project-based instead of like theoretical right. abstract concepts. Um, and they made the freshman class divided by experience level so you wouldn't be intimidated by the geeky guys. That's smart. Yeah, that's a good and, idea. Yeah, and over the course of five years, they increased the number of computer science women from 12% to 40%. <gasps> so there really are approaches out there that can work um, and, and are scalable, I think. What do you think that is? Do you, you think women just want to have more sort of hands-on? Because like project-based, yeah. instead of classroom theorizing, maybe they, they want to experience more, um, yeah, so do there, more? I think so. I mean, there are, so it's hard to understand why, but they yeah. do see in many fields that um, women tend to respond better to projects that um, have more tangible impact on society. Um, so women and men respond, but women respond more. Right. Um, 
So project-based learning is, you know, sort of a trend in engineering in general, but it's, it has a side effect of pulling in women. The second piece, which we didn't talk about, is bias, right? There's overt discrimination, but nowadays, at least in the U.S., it's mostly unconscious bias. Um, and at MIT, that's been sort of really handled head on. We train the faculty. We have a diversity officer. We make sure everyone gets the same pay. I mean, that's doubled the faculty numbers over the course of 10 years. So, you know, all of these things, I think, have interventions now. Yeah associated with that. I mean that's it's yeah. been it's researched that in the past the problem was that uh, female students weren't even called upon in right. class in college right. by the professor. They sort of were overlooked. Yeah. But it's the good raise to your hear. hand. I yeah. mean even Cheryl Sandberg, you know, just sit at the table. So a lot of that is, you know, internal, making right. sure that women participate, gain confidence, they're encouraged. And so you're seeing that change going on, so that must give you some hope that there's going to be a lot more girls interested in these fields and wanting to go into these fields. It does. I, um, I, I have a little bit of pause because in biology, we've had over 50% women for 20 years at the undergrad level. And if you look at the biotech startups in Cambridge, 3% are started by women. So there's something else that happens. It's not just enough to get them into college. Um, there's who's in the boardroom, who's a, who's a founder, who are the venture capitalists. So, you know, I think it's, it's important that when more women are coming in, but we need to do more to keep them in and to grow them up as leaders. That's, that's encouragement <laughs> enough, I think, when girls see those role models rather than just imagine it. I think so. Actually, there's good data on that, too, now. Oh, there is? Yeah. Okay, good. Oh, I know. It's called the role model effect. Oh, um, nice. There was an amazing study done in India. I was in politics. Um, but what they showed was that... Um, there's a bunch of villages where they had a quota system and they had to have women elected to government okay. in those villages. And they found in those villages over the course of 10 years that young girls, their aspirations for themselves improved by 30% and that parents' aspirations for their daughters, just by having a woman in government, improved by 20%. Wow. So the fact that the community could see a capable woman in power That's right. um, changed people's aspirations for themselves and for their children. Um, so, I, you know, I think that really translates across fields. Last question then, what's next for you in terms of your research? Yeah. What's coming up? We have up? lots to do. So yeah. we're working on this early cancer detector and um, we're really excited about making a urine test for early cancer detection for things like breast cancer and colon cancer and ovarian cancer and lung cancer. Wow. Um, and we're hoping to be able to deploy it um, globally so it could be really cheap and available at the point of care. And in order to do that, we just started a company um, that can take it you know, through manufacturing and regulatory. So that's kind of my latest baby. <laughs> that's a big baby. It is, yeah. It's and that Glimpse. would be amazing if that were, were to come to fruition, just a simple urine test. It to would be, be exciting. Able to detect. Yeah. yeah. Well, good luck to you, and thank you so much for your thank time. You. Amazing work that you're doing. Thank so you. So keep on doing it, and keep on being that role model. I'll try.